Hey, what's up? Welcome to your Wednesday episode of Locked on Raptors. And on today's show, we are digging into the most interesting race in the NBA ahead of the playoffs. It is the race for the sixth seed in the Eastern Conference. The Raptors very much caught up in that. We're going to talk about the Celtics and the Nets. Are the Nets ever going to win again? Are the Celtics ever going to lose again? And what about the Hornets and the Hawks? We will handicap the race for the sixth seed on today's show with James Herbert from CBSSports.com. Thanks for being here. Stick around. You are Locked On Raptors, your daily Toronto Raptors podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, what's going on? James stopped dancing. He was dancing while the music was playing, and now I'm sitting here holding the bag. There we go. Welcome to episode number 1120 of Locked On Raptors for Wednesday, February the 16th. I'm your host, Sean Woodley of RaptorsHQ.com. You can find me on Twitter, as always, at WoodleySean. You can find the show at Locked On Raptors, and you can find the podcast free and available on all your favorite podcast platforms in audio form. Plus, you can go to YouTube and subscribe over there. It's very much appreciated. Over 1,620 people have subbed over there, and it's very, very lovely. Let's push it towards 2,000, shall we? Uh, and as always, a big thank you for making us your first listen of the day. All right, let's get to it. We've got a loaded show to get to today with a man who knows a whole lot about basketball, far more than I do, and I just throw out takes about guys like P.J. Washington off air, and he says, ah, he's actually good, but I go, ah, he stinks. We'll get to that later on, I'm sure. Uh, it is James Herbert from CBSSports.com. James, you are wearing the King Cake Baby hoodie before the show. We spent 10 minutes trying to find this so I could purchase it for myself. I'm very sad it's not uh, available at the moment, but I might just DM the man himself, the KCB, to see if I can get a little connect. Uh, James, how are you, man? I am doing great. Any day where I have an occasion to wear a King Cake Baby hoodie and I will be praised for it instead of ridiculed is just a wonderful day. Um, so I, I'm thrilled to be here. I, I assume we're going to spend the whole time discussing Herb Jones and the New Orleans Pelicans um, based on what what yeah. we saw the other night. Yeah, Herb Jones, the opposite of P.J. Washington. Actually good, and the guy who I want on my team. Uh, that guy, I, he's a problem, man. The Pelicans... If they have figured out how to play defense, uh, and Zion comes back, obviously that's the big caveat. That that's a troublesome uh, concoction they got going on down there. But we don't have to talk about the Pelicans. We've already uh, belabored that game on Monday quite a bit. But that maybe does cloud the perception of the Toronto Raptors after that game as they lose by thirty. I'm more so chalking it up to uh, it was the day after they spent the Sunday of the Super Bowl in New Orleans. It's probably all right, and they'll probably come back out tonight against the Minnesota Timberwolves, free of the nightlife of Minneapolis, burdening them on Tuesday night and probably play a pretty good game. Minneapolis is a pretty good nightlife town, as I understand it. But on a Tuesday night in the middle of February, maybe not so much. Either way, the Raptors, James. They have been playing reasonably well lately, of course. they Probably better than reasonably. They won eight in a row. They beat a lot of really good teams in the Eastern Conference in the process, and they nearly beat the uh, Denver Nuggets on Saturday as well in a game where they might have played their best overall offensive game of the bunch, and then the Pelicans game kind of sours it. But for you, looking at the way the Raptors have progressed here so far, like before we dive into the race for the sixth seed, and we'll talk about the Celtics and the Nets, et cetera, I kind of want to get your read on where the Raptors are. You know, the, you watch from afar, you watch the whole league, you see them in the context of the entire league in a way that in you know, our little Raptors bubble here, we maybe don't. Uh, what's your read on this team right now? Are, are you like, are, are they as good as like the team that flirted with the sixth seed for a while there? Was that maybe a brief dalliance into a tier that they're not quite part of just yet? What's your overall read on where this team is at the moment as they sit at 31 and 20? 25 with one game left before the all-star break. I think that they are that team. Like, I don't think anybody, I mean, but maybe with the exception of Gary Trent, who was just making every shot that he took, it mm -hmm. was like playing super above their head. I mean, Pascal Siakam had maybe the best stretch of his career. Um, that Denver game. I mean, I am still sort of processing Ooh. what I saw that night. Like it was unbelievable, but also like, it did make sense to me like that, that mm -hmm. like, I think what we've seen from Siakam on this recent stretch, the, the literal most recent game excluded uh, is kind of a culmination of what he's been working toward the last few years. Um, healthy mm -hmm. confidence, 
Um, I, I think when when Masai Ujiri talked about him, he said, like, I can see Pascal is feeling himself out there. And I, I just I don't think we have seen him look quite that assertive and just like the quick decisions, understanding exactly where his shot is going to come from. And then that touch just just absolutely returning to him in, in, in the best possible way, combined with the defense mm-hmm. that he'd been playing all year anyway. Like he yeah. I, I thought even before the offense came around this year, he was playing incredibly high level defense and like if he keeps this up he's an all nba level player which oh by the way we've seen before like he, he did make all nba um so yeah i mean it the only thing to me is it's hard to kind of separate their record and their play during that stretch with the minutes that we're going to the starters i mean this is yeah. like historic stuff in terms of how many minutes their, their top five guys are playing so you wonder when they have a bit of a letdown before the all-star break when you're seeing, I mean, typically you see a lot of teams kind of have those games, whether it's physical exhaustion, mental exhaustion, whatever, like you, you would sort of expect that from this team, right? Mm -hmm. Like this team, I think needs a break more than the average team. Um, And you, you do wonder coming back from that, are they going to keep pushing the minutes exactly like that? How much does that young change things and like where does this sort of go in the, in, in the home stretch of the season because on the one hand you're battling for position you want to stay out of the play and if, if you can um and on the other hand you don't want to just kill everybody's legs um mm-hmm. and have them worn out by the time that you are potentially in the the play in or the playoff so like I think really early on in this season, I love the style that the Raptors were playing. I think they're playing that style at a higher level now. I think the the half court offense is looking better than it did early on, but they, their bread is still buttered on defense and in transition with all the athleticism that they have. Like they are when they're locked in. I think one of the more fun watches in the NBA, partially because they're different, partially because they just play harder than everybody else. (laughs) It's weird to say that after the Pelicans game. Right. But yeah, that's, that's kind of like, that's the identity of the team. So I've loved what I've seen from them. I've obviously loved what I've seen from, from Pascal and Fred and and Gary Trent. Um, You'd like it if they're, the bench was a bit more of a strength and they had more depth, but Hey, I mean, Thad Young is here now. It's a, bit strange because they have so many bigs but <laughs> i i'm a huge that young guy so i'm excited about what's to come with the raptors too yeah i am big on thad young's ability to potentially help limit those minutes for siakam and barnes in particular because he kind of does things that they do obviously not to the same level but you know with his you know dribble handoff game the fact that he's a good passer like uh, short roll stuff i feel like he can kind of fill in those gaps a little bit so you don't have to feel like you need to have Siakam on the floor for 43 minutes. Maybe it's 37 minutes or 38, and you can kind of get by with that because he seems to be uh, pretty damn well conditioned and everything. Yeah, you know, to the Thad Young point, like he's a obviously like a Raptors type player. I, I think the first game in which he played probably didn't do any favors to those of the people you know who were like, oh, this is great. Like add and double down on what the Raptors do well. And who cares about shooting or backup point guard play or another center? Like, who gives a damn? They got Thad Young, and he's going to do what the Raptors want to do. Do you think they have maybe painted themselves into a difficult corner here with their first four bench guys being all power forwards or centers? Like, Or do you think it's a feature, not a bug, the fact that they can continue to play the way that they want to play with these long, chaotic dudes out there? At, at all moments of the game like you know the shooting i think is probably like the limiting factor here the fact that none of those guys are now that chris boucher doesn't really take threes anymore none of those guys are shooters in any way shape or form you know thad's had some success in small doses throughout his career but not really recently is it trouble for you that they don't have any shooting off the bench right now like or is it like a, all right maybe they work at a Utah Watanabe or his Fima Hailuk once again and maybe that kind of fills that in or are you just cool with uh yeah you know they've figured it out so far with limited spacing they've made things work with you know their cutting and the way that they work off ball and they've kind of survived without shooting so far what's to say that they can't do it with just another guy on the team who's not a shooter yeah, I, I think I, I would like to see Utah get another shot at some point. Um, yeah, I, I do think Thad it's Young. It's weird is the... that he lost his job after two games post COVID. I will say it. it's bizarre. Yeah, and that's not to say that he needs to be in a play in slash playoff rotation or anything. Mm-hmm. But I, I would just like to see him get another shot mm-hmm. and see what that looks like. Um, the, the thing about Thad Young 
is as far as non shooters go, I don't think he necessarily hurts your spacing too much because he is not um, a non shooter, non playmaker, not yeah. like just kind of like, um, you know, he, he's not some kind of stiff out there. Like he is a guy you can run your offense through if you want to. Yeah, and he moves um, well young, like, off the ball into like little pockets of space, right? It's not like three point spacing, but it's okay. I can go to you know snap to this area where Siakam seeing two guys, and then all of a sudden I have an easy floater out of it. Absolutely, I mean he is one of the smarter players in in the entire NBA, and I think, um, I mean th this might sound nuts, but last year when he was with the Bulls, at least before they they acquired Vucevic, and that made the fit a little more iffy like Thaddeus Young was like genuinely one of my favorite players to watch in the entire league I, I think mm -hmm. maybe Stacey King the Bulls color commentator is the only person who had more fun <laughs> watching Thad Young last year because he would be yelling Thadjik Johnson after every play that he made and, and th this man <laughs> was playing point center for the Bulls he was pushing in transition making these highlight passes he was facilitating from the elbows he was doing just about everything and by, he was making some like preposterous percentage of those lefty hooks that he's been doing uh for like more than a decade in, in the NBA now and then on the defensive end I mean he's just so savvy he's so strong mm -hmm. he can guard multiple positions he you know, he, he has become a center, which is funny for a guy who came into the league as sort of a, a small forward tweener guy. <laughs> um, but that that's the way things have gone for a, a lot of guys who have who have lasted this long in the NBA is you start as a three, you go to a full time four, then eventually, oh, hello, I've, I've woken up as a small ball five. And <laughs> um, the, the thing about coming to the Raptors is it's just not that simple. Like yeah. he might. I What was that lineup? I think it was in the fourth quarter. He was maybe the smallest guy on the floor yeah, he it was, was just, yeah just just five <laughs> bigs like i don't know that i've ever seen anything quite like that except for the other times that the raptors have done stuff kind of like that mm -hmm. um so i think it is an interesting fit i think that for the coaching staff it's absolutely a feature you want him is another option and i think mm -hmm. he does some stuff that the other bigs don't do or at least don't do as well but you have to kind of figure out over the, the course of the rest of the season, what are the ideal lineups for him to play? When do you want yeah. to put him in this game? I wouldn't mind if he were just the sixth man, because I believe that guy that, that I loved watching in Chicago is still there, despite mm -hmm. what we saw or really what we didn't see in San Antonio, because he was chained to the bench. Yeah. Um, and that guy is just, he would easily be the, the Raptors best bench player. So I think go for it. I can understand not throwing him in there like that right away. You want to see how this thing looks, but if he's playing with a whole bunch of guys who can't shoot, then all of that stuff that that we love that he does, he's an amazing screener. Like maybe like if not the best, then one of the top two or three screeners the Raptors have on the team. Mm -hmm. He is a very good passer. He is really good, like you said, cutting into open space. He is not the sort of guy who will cut on top of another guy who is cutting. Um, the he he knows how to leverage the space when his defender is giving it up. Like he will go mm -hmm. and do a handoff and get a guy an open look. He is like really good in all of those areas. All that stuff is harder or next to impossible if nobody can shoot at all, because right. then all of those pockets are so much smaller. And then even if he isn't cutting on top of guys, maybe those other guys don't have the same understanding of space. And you see a bunch of guys running into each other. And you even saw some of that in that Pelicans game, which I still kind of want to throw out just because that they're, team had no juice that night mm -hmm. um so i think it it is clearly going to be like a challenge to integrate him uh but i don't think it's to the point where it's like oh man like why why do they do this why right. do they turn Dragic into another big because this big like if he's as good as i think he is then it's absolutely worth it and you just have to spend some time kind of experimenting yeah, I like the idea of him playing like with a lot of mix of like heavy starters because of the spacing that those yeah. guys offer. And I just think like he's the kind of guy who can complement a Siakam or a Fred or an OG really nicely. And you know, I, I think there's a world in which he closes games at the five and plays to Scotty Barnes. You know, if if Barnes is struggling as he has a little bit recently, uh, we're going to continue on here, James, and uh, turn our attention to the rest of the race for the Eastern Conference's six seed, the Celtics and the Nets in particular. We'll get to those teams and run through their case to be the sixth best team in the East in just one second here. But first, want to tell you better friends over at Prize Picks. All right, NBA fans, you're looking for a daily fantasy option for basketball then you need to try the award-winning app 
prize picks prize picks is daily fantasy made easy it's super easy to use you pick two to five player, players and an over under on their projections and you can win up to 10 times on any entry and it's just you versus the projected numbers entries can be made in 60 seconds or less it's that easy prize picks is safe and offers fast withdrawals and you can use their award-winning app on the app store and google play you can even do mixed sport entries as well so if you are a hockey person and a basketball person you can go and mishmash those sports if you like that you can you know you can pick a player who you love from uh you know the same city on two teams whatever you want it's all available to you at prize picks it's your choice and they don't just offer the nba of course they offer soccer mlb nfl and mlb <laughs> that'd be fun uh one day college basketball college football mma even and more for a limited time prize picks has an exclusive no-brainer offer for all users get uh, all of our users that is who would listen to lockdown shows uh lockdown listeners get 50 dollars for free if a player in your first prize picks entry scores a single point but you must use the code nba that's right it's an exclusive offer for Locked On fans. Sign up today. Use the code NBA for 50 bucks free if a player in your prize picks entry scores a single point. That seems like free money to me. Go check them out at prizepicks.com. Uh, and we continue on here with your first listen of the day with James Herbert from CBSSports.com. And now let's turn our attention to a pair of teams going in very different directions in between which the Raptors are sandwiched. The Boston Celtics have not lost in a very long time. It's very annoying. Uh, the Raptors go on an eight-game winning streak <laughs> and gain no ground whatsoever. Now have, in fact, lost ground on the Celtics. Let's dive into them first. The Nets are a whole other uh, interesting conversation we'll get to in a sec here. But with Boston, I mean, it's hard to deny. As much as, uh, you know, the dastardly Boston Celtics are not a team you want to heap praise upon, they have been playing out of their <laughs> minds. They've been, like, by all sort of metrics, like the best team in the NBA since the start of the new year. Their defense has been basically impenetrable. Jason Tatum has turned around his season after shooting like 49% true shooting for the first couple months of the season or thereabouts and is now up to around league average. Uh, Jalen Brown obviously gunning away too. And they get Derek White over the deadline. Daniel Tice goes in there as well at the deadline. It's just the team that, you know, it, it pains me, but I think they're better than the Raptors right now. And I, I don't really know. They, they just make more sense, I guess. It's a little bit more of a traditional team. That's not to say the Raptors don't make sense. It's still just figuring out how they do make sense and what the best sort of iterations are. Like, is Boston closer to the Raptors' Nets tier right now? Or do you think they're maybe kind of punching in the tier above with how well they played here, James? Like, do the Raptors stand a chance of catching them for the sixth seed now that they pass them? I wouldn't bet on it. Um, I don't think they're necessarily in different tiers, though. Uh, to mm -hmm. me, like that top tier is sort of like it's it's the Bucks, it's Miami, and then the rest is like to be determined. Um, yeah, yeah. I I, I don't want to put anybody else in there necessarily. Uh, arguably, Chicago deserves to be in there based on how they played before Caruso and Ball went down. Mm -hmm. um, I think you can make a pretty easy case that Philadelphia should be in there theoretically and Brooklyn should be in there theoretically and Boston should be in there based on how they played for the last little while. But I am just kind of in, in wait and see mode. I, I think the Celtics are playing as well as anybody in the entire league right now. Uh, I don't know if you saw the, the 538 Raptor uh, projections for for the rest of the season and that, that um, statistical model has the Celtics as having like a – I think the 20, 23% chance, which is the best chance of any team in the league to win the championship uh, after last night. Um, so that, that sure. that's where, <laughs> where they're at, um, uh -huh. according to one model. Um, you know, look, they, they defensively, they have been insane. And I, I think coming into the year, if you were talking about what the Celtics path was to being a fringe contender, um it was be an absolutely lockdown defensive team. Mm -hmm. And it took a little while for it to come together. Um, they were switching absolutely everything coming into the year. And I, I think they got better and better at that. And they also got better at like when to switch and when not to. Like they, they have Rob Williams who was turning into this absolute monster. I mean, he was already, I mean, I went to a playoff game last year where he blocked like eight shots in, in Brooklyn. <laughs> um, he was already an intimidating guy, but I think he's becoming a better all around rim protector. And you, you can, mm -hmm. you can see they, they have switched him a little more, um, but they also will 
drop him back. They also are not afraid to play him higher um, when, when they want to. They can do different things out there. And then the rest of the lineup, I mean, right now they have no weak links mm-hmm. uh, defensively in, like in their starting five. And even in like these bench units at this point, Schroeder's gone. Um, they, I mean, my guy, Grant Williams, who I've loved since he was a rookie, I profiled him at that point. Like he is now uh, a lights out shooter, uh, which is nice. And and he's a little bit more involved in the offense. And you've just seen like the way Brown and Tatum are playing lately, the way White has fit in just as seamlessly as sort of you would have hoped if you were a Boston fan and feared if you were um, a team that that is competing with them and saw that transaction. Like it, mm-hmm. it has been just, it has been seamless. White. I think makes their offense that much smoother and better. He's not as good of a shooter as Josh Richardson, but he's such a good connector. He makes super fast decisions. He's a ball mover, which they needed because the whole thing, when they were struggling, their defense was always pretty good. They had some stretches where it went away and they were kind of discouraged. And I think the offense was affecting the defense, but when they were struggling, it, it was the offense that was the massive problem. You had these two guys, who are really talented, but it just didn't seem cohesive. And you had Marcus Smart talking about it in the media and this becoming this huge story. Um, and now they just they just seem like a much more connected team. The, the ball is popping around a lot more. They're getting better shots. They're still not a team that puts like a massive amount of pressure on the rim aside from Rob Williams rolling toward it. Um, right. But they're they're getting high percentage looks and they, they seem to know who they are as a team. It's a defense first team, but the offense has gotten a lot better and they're, Mm -hmm. they're looking really formidable. Yeah. I don't really fancy the Raptors finishing ahead of them at the moment. And, you know, I I guess it's possible that one of the other teams in the top six falls out. It's so clustered and close right now that, Hey, maybe the Sixers hit some hard Mm -hmm. times as they wait for Harden to come back. Or maybe the Cavaliers who I still kind of keep on thinking (laughs) like at some point it's got to fall out of the bottom a little bit here. Maybe not. Maybe they're just good. Maybe their their defense is too good, and maybe Darius Garland and Jared Allen and Evan Mobley is too big a trio to really you know mess with. But I still kind of think that's a TBD thing with the Cavs down the stretch of the season here too. But yeah, the, the Celtics I feel like they're probably ahead of the Raptors for good at this point, unless the Raptors you know the Raptors do have a pretty easy schedule coming up. Like they have a lot of games where they should be favored to win at least. You would have said that against the Pelicans on Monday too. So maybe that you take that for what it's worth. You're not going to go through and just pick wins on the schedule, but it's going to be a tall order to take down the Celtics and get past them. So then you're maybe looking at all right, maybe seven is where we're going to sort of cap out in terms of finishing uh this season and we'll get that home date in the play in which would be nice if you're taking on the Brooklyn Nets in a play-in because uh, Kyrie Irving won't be able to travel for the game. The Nets, man, we're going to dig it. We should probably take take a break, and then we'll get into the the Nets on the other side because this is a whole uh, spicy meatball to sort of dig into and (laughs) and dissect. So we'll get to that in just one second here. But first, I want to tell you about our friends over at betonline.ag. Excuse me, just bet online. Bet football might be over for this season, but basketball is in full steam for both pro and college hoops. From all the latest odds, totals, player performance props to where the next fire coach is going to land, betonline.net is the number one spot for all the sports betting needs in your life. BetOnline remains the best spot for all your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. And it's not just basketball. BetOnline is your source for hockey, boxing, and UFC odds, right to your favorite Olympic coverage and information and more. Eventually, you'll be able to put money down on the Toronto Blue Jays, winning the World Series whenever baseball comes back. Someday, we'll, we'll, we'll see, maybe. Maybe. I hope, hope it comes back. Uh, head to the website today or use your mobile device and learn more about the trends and action. Bet online is where the game starts. And we round out your first listen of the day with a final segment here with James Herbert from CBSSports.com. You are in Brooklyn. The Brooklyn Nets are also in Brooklyn. Uh, <laughs> Kyrie Irving's not in Brooklyn when they play. <laughs> he's in Brooklyn. He's just not in. Yeah, sure. He's, he's, he's not allowed. Yeah, he's he's not barred from being in Brooklyn because he doesn't have a vax. It's not that intense there. They don't have martial law in place. That's good to know. Um, or maybe it's not. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> let's move past that. The they're currently right now thirty and twenty-seven. They won their last game against the Sacramento Kings, who are a wretched tire fire, even with some interesting, fun new pieces and uh, potential to grow into something more. They're still the Kings. Uh, And so the Nets won that game. They are still in a tailspin, and they still do not have Ben Simmons or Kevin Durant playing for them, and Kyrie Irving is obviously only playing in half the games. 
<laughs> what, how do you even like? How do you analyze this? It's not. It doesn't make any sense. I guess the way to begin this is like there's not really a timetable just yet for KD's return as of February 12th. I think Nick Friedel reported that that there's no uh, timeline in place just yet. You know, you would assume if you're doing the math, maybe sometime near after the All Star break, but who's to say there? And I guess the reports are that they're not going to bring Simmons back until KD is there either. So. The question, I guess, becomes, will the Nets be too far out of it by the time they get KD back for them to even matter in the race for the six or seven seed? Are they going to be more kind of in the tier with the Hornets and Hawks where they're battling against the sad-ass Wizards for, for the staying in the play? And, like, do you see them losing as much ground, that much ground over the next little while here before KD gets back for this to, to even matter? I actually think they should be okay in that regard just because I think the ceiling's really high if they ever do get everybody. And when I say everybody, mm. I'm assuming that doesn't even include Joe Harris, who might need a second ankle surgery. They have not yeah. made an announcement on that front yet. He's an incredibly important part of the team. Uh, while the addition of Seth Curry partially covers for what he brings, it's not exactly the same. Um, they, they have a little, even though they're both two of the best shooters in the NBA, two of the best shooters in NBA history statistically, um, their strengths are a little bit different. Curry can do a little bit more off the bounce. Harris is just much bigger and defensively mm -hmm. can, can guard more positions um, and do so at, at a higher level. Um, but I mean, if you look at the one game sample that we have with Drummond and Curry on the team, I, I do <laughs> think uh, there were some reasons to be encouraged. Like they, they clearly needed just bodies, right? Like sure. they, they just needed some other guys who could sop up minutes and they happened to get guys who addressed a lot of the things that have been plaguing them. I mean, Drummond sets really good screens. I mean, he did so for Curry. He addresses their biggest weakness, which is rebounding, which has killed them in a lot of games this year. And I just think, like, I mean, I've written a lot about the Nets since the trade. I think I have another column going. If it's not up now, it'll be up soon. Um, but it's mostly talking about kind of the theoretical Nets of when they get Ben Simmons rather than what we're looking at in the short term, because I'm not sure what we're looking at right now matters. I think the key is like if they get like Ben Simmons and Kevin Durant together on the court, even if Kyrie is is not playing in most of the games, which I mean, as of now, he will not play in most of the games because most of yeah. their games um, are either um, at home or like they have a quote unquote road game in New York coming up. Like right. where he cannot, he cannot play at MSG either. Um, but, but if you have those two guys and then you have the shooting of, of Patty Mills and Seth Curry, and you have some of the other role players that, that they have on that team. I mean, Bruce Brown, who was so good for them last year, um, became a lot more important after the trade they just made because they had to waive Raptor legend, Deandre Bembry, who took a lot of his <laughs> minutes, um, earlier this year and Bruce Brown responded by having like the, the best game of his season in, in that game against what do you call them? The wretched Kings. Um, so <laughs> if, if like, I just, I see lineups that make a lot more sense now um, than some of the lineups that, that we've been watching even earlier in the year when they had Harden and KD together, it was just not a balanced team. They did not have the spacing. Mm -hmm. Like it's not hard to figure out why James Harden was, unhappy playing basketball in Brooklyn because the environment, I mean, I I've seen this framed in a lot of different places. Like he was unhappy because he had to do what he did in Houston. Like, no, like it was worse. <laughs> yeah. He had that, that playmaking load, but he didn't have like any driving lanes. Yeah. So he, he couldn't just go one-on-one -on -one and go to the basket and make the simple play. He had to play in a phone booth. He had to go drive and there were other defenders waiting there and if he made that pass to the open guy in the corner oftentimes that guy would just break the shot or turn it down and when, right. when, when once you turn down that shot then the offense just grinds to a halt and um i i just i think about the fit of simmons there i think the way i framed it when i first wrote about the trade was like he diversifies the team mm -hmm. and i think he diversifies the team in a couple of ways one in the more immediate sense it means they're not just like all right we are going to be the best offensive team you've ever seen in your entire life. And which, the, by the way, they literally were the best offensive team in history <laughs> last year, even though they barely had the, the three guys together. Like, <laughs> it's not just we're going to kill you that way. Um, it is they're going to they have the potential to be a really high ceiling offensive team. And oh, by the way, they're going to be that much more 
versatile defensively now now that they have one of the best defenders on the planet in Simmons. Oh, by the way, they, they won't get killed on the glass every night. Um, they were really terrifying in transition when they got going last year, especially when Harden was on the bench and Kyrie was pushing it. Guess mm-hmm. what? They just added Ben Simmons to that. Like, they would be <laughs> even better in transition now. Like, And then I think the other way it diversified the team was like, Maybe you look at it and you say, like, they are not as scary at full strength as they were with those three guys this year. Fine. Like, I I, I think I agree with that um, mm-hmm. in, in the immediate sense. But I think they're, they're not as all in completely on winning now. They have a younger player. Um, they're a bit deeper now after the trade that they made. And mm-hmm. they got two draft picks that will make it easier to improve the roster on the margins in yeah. the summer, which is like... That is the challenge for the front office of any super team. Um, so, like, that is why I like the trade. Um, but in terms of, like, their prospects for the rest of the year, like, I imagine they'll keep kind of sliding and trying to grind out whatever wins they can, um, sort of featuring Seth Curry and featuring Bruce Brown and in pick and rolls and all of this stuff um, over the next little while. But if they can establish chemistry quickly when they get – Durant and Simmons back, maybe that happens at the same time, as you said, then mm-hmm. I, I totally could see them just going on a big run, regardless of Irving's availability. Yeah, I, I guess the limiting factor is time, right? They only are going to have like 24 games left after the All-Star break to gain that ground back. And uh, yeah. I think with the way the rest of the top teams in the East are playing, it's going to be difficult for them to gain ground until they get KD and Simmons back. And so, yeah, if they get them back with 15 games left, sure, they could go 12 and three to close the season, you know, assuming they kind of coalesce pretty quickly. Um, You know, that's, I think, expecting a lot from Simmons who hasn't played all year, but it's possible because Kevin Durant is that good. And as you mentioned, like the team makes a little bit more sense now. Um, Yeah, man, they're, they're terrifying for sure. Like an idea of like a lineup where they go like KD and Simmons in the front court with Curry, potentially Harris, if he ever comes back and you, you throw out Kyrie as well. I mean, it's, it's t- tough stuff. I don't know how you guard it. It, it seems just as unguardable yeah. as the team with Harden. So um, it's yeah. it's they're, they're going to be really good once they are full health. I would say for this season, though, when it comes to this specific race, I think the Raptors probably have the inside track of finishing ahead of them, which could be really, really valuable if those Vax mandates may, you know stay in place all the way until the middle of April when the plan yeah. will be going on, which is two months. Anything can change. Who knows? The you know Doug Ford gave up on COVID yesterday. Said it's over. It's done. <laughs> so maybe uh, maybe that's going to change at some point here soon. But I, <sighs> I'm not going to bank on that necessarily. Um, you know, when it comes to the, I should note, there's a big stretch for the Raptors coming up. They, after the All Star break, they take on the Hornets and Hawks again because they cannot get enough of those teams. Uh, and then they have a home and home with the Nets on the 28th of February and March 1st. I don't know if we'll see either of those guys back by then. That feels maybe a little bit soon. It's only two weeks away. So that is kind of the the stretch there. If they can beat those, those that, that, that Nets team in those two games, that I think really will probably give them a cushion to finish ahead of them pretty comfortably yeah. with only, you know, by that time, 20 games left and potentially like a four-game lead in the standings. They've got two games on them in the loss column right now. Uh, let's go to the Hornets and Hawks very quickly here. I don't think they factor into the six seed race necessarily. The Hawks feel like they burned a lot of energy getting back to 500 after their ass start to the season and maybe they're just kind of realizing, oh, it's difficult to play at that level for an entire second half of a season even though I guess they kind of did it last year so they had some experience yeah. in this department. Um, but, you know, the Hornets and Hawks, do you think either of them factor into that race for the six seed or are they more teams that you're wary of if you're the Raptors as like playing opponents in a you know, potential second play in game or something like that i think if one of them does it's the hawks and i say that as somebody who like i watch a lot of hornets i like adore the way that they play like they're really fun i love watching Lamelo. i love watching miles bridges like that is a team that i have personally followed really closely but i just don't think they're on the same level um and Mm -hmm. they haven't been in terms of consistency this year um the hawks have been extremely inconsistent themselves but i do think they're much better than they showed earlier on in the year there were a lot of factors Mm -hmm. i mean much like last year like they they struggled at the beginning of the year oh by the way um bogdan bogdanovich was hurt like the entire time um (laughs) that's that's the same this year when, when they had their their bad start like since he's come back most recently he's been shooting better than 40 percent he's been not quite as much of a sieve defensively um, he gives them another playmaking option like that. That's important for this team. I think they still they as great as their offense has, has been, um, they still sometimes 
again, switching defenses in particular, they can look a little bit Trey Young dependent. They can bog sure. down. Um, bog sometimes. down Bogdanovich, you mean? They they can bog down Bogdanovich. Absolutely. <laughs> um, uh, but I think like what you really want, um, I mean, not as a, as a Raptor fan, but what you want if you're the Hawks is to find some defensive consistency. And I think DeAndre Hunter... Um, coming back has changed who they are. Um, he is a shutdown defender. He is a guy. I mean, I think he's a pretty good team defender um, as well. And then you've got Capella or whether you have him or a Kongwu out there. Um, you've got some pretty good interior defense. It's just if you look at the, act- the actual numbers, like it's they still say Atlanta's terrible defensive team, like one of the worst transition defenses in the NBA, which in a potential matchup with Toronto is like that. That's nice for, for the bad. Raptors to see. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> But I do think, like, in a play-in situation, like, they are dangerous. Like, they're mm-hmm. not that different from the team that went to the conference finals last year. Now, was that the profile of a typical conference finals team? Maybe not. But, like, that's still, like, a very good team and a pretty balanced team at that. Um, so I, I do think their upside is pretty high. Um, and the, just the talent level compared to where they are in the standings like that's not normal it is not normal yeah. to see a team if you watch the hawks best games yeah and then you showed that like you looked at their record you would be like how is this even possible and <laughs> with, with the hornets it's, it's a little bit different like the, the yeah. hornets i i there's also been a lot of variation um but i think a lot of that is due to kind of the normal sort of randomness that affects games, their own shot making. And then they do a lot of like gimmicky defenses, a lot of zones. And like, if, if you are missing threes against the Hornets, you are probably going to lose. Um, Mm -hmm. That's kind of how it works. Like they, they give up a ton of those threes. They look a little bit different now after the trade that they made They're they're playing a lot bigger. Um, But I think the identity of the team is still, is still sort of, sort of the same there. These are two teams that are very offense focused, but I think the Hawks have a higher, much higher defensive ceiling than, than Charlotte. Yeah, I think I agree with that. You know, the Hawks just make sense as like a roster. Uh, they're like the anti-Raptors in, in terms of like, oh yeah, huh. like they have shooting guards and wings and bigs and they all come together and these lineups are all, uh, yeah, like traditional and they make a lot of sense to the brain. The Raptors, as I, I tweeted recently, I think to truly appreciate the Raptors, you might need the help of magic mushrooms to really kind of expand your mind and see, uh, <laughs> you know, the possibilities there. So we've been nuanced and detailed and uh, thorough on this podcast, James. I'm now going to ask you for a five word answer to the final question I have for you right now. Pick your six through 10 finishing order between the five teams we've talked about so far today Raptors, Hawks, Celtics, uh, Nets, and Hornets. Just give me an order six through 10. What is your predicted finishing order for those teams? Celtics, Nets, Raptors, Hawks, Hornets. I think I'm close. I'm going to go Celtics, Raptors. Hawks, Nets, Hornets. I think the Nets are still going to lose some games here as they wait to get their guys back. And I think that's going to hurt them in a close race. Uh, But that feels like a pretty good place to leave this off. James, thanks so much for being here, man. Uh, You've been writing a ton over at CBSSports.com. You mentioned you've been writing a lot about the Nets, so people can go check that out. Anything else people should check out uh, over at CBSSports.com? I will, well... I will tease this in, in in the coming weeks. I'm not. I don't have a date for it, but I, I will be having a uh, a Raptors centric story dropping, and uh, maybe, maybe we, we can talk about it when it when it comes out. That's one of my favorite genres of episode is James writes a piece on the Raptors and we bring you on to talk about it. So we will definitely do that, pal. Uh, everyone go read all of James's great work uh, and uh, go follow him for all the King Cake Baby propaganda that you know and love. Uh, and they're just beautiful. Just I'm going to make this big screen for a second. We got to get this on the big screen. It's beautiful. Look at it. Look at it. It's just a wonderful garment. Everybody go and pick it up. Uh, support the Pelicans. Support KCB everything uh anyway that'll do it uh thank you so much for tuning in you can find me on twitter at woodley sean subscribe to rate review etc on all your favorite podcast platforms for the low low price of on the house you can also go to youtube and subscribe to the video feed of the show 
as well. We'll be back again tomorrow. Yasmin Duala from Yahoo Sports and Dishes and Dimes is going to pop on the show to talk about the game against the Wolves. And then on Friday, Katie Heindel is going to stop by. And we're going to tee up All-Star Weekend. And uh, that's what you have to close out your week. Thanks so much for being here. We'll talk to you again tomorrow with another episode of Locked On Raptors. Now go make your second listen of the day, Locked On Bets, as your boy Q and Lee Sterling are helping you win lots of cash over there with all of their gambling insight. That'll do it. Bye-bye. <laughs>